Uh, Laura? 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 It said my speaker wasn't operating properly. Uh, if you could start. Yeah. Uh, hello, can you hear? Can someone uh, reply and ask if? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, everything is all right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's fine. Okay, thank you. Well, it's a new week. Uh, we're carrying on uh, these lectures on China. Is there any uh, matter left over from last lecture that you want to discuss or any other administrative matter? Good morning, Professor. Um, I do have a question actually. Last Wednesday, I wasn't able to attend class because there was no internet in my area. And I just checked and the, the video isn't on YouTube yet. Will you be putting posting that? Uh, yes, I would hope to. Is, does anybody, uh, has anybody else consulted this video? You said it's Wednesday's video. Yeah, uh, the 23rd. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, I'll look into that um, after this lecture. Okay, thank you. Anything else uh, people concerned about? We're doing okay. And I think, uh, we're right on track basically with, with regard to the presentation of the course. So, uh, last time I left off, actually, I was discussing uh, the foreign policy of China, and uh, this is characteristic of uh, uh, most of the dynasties. Uh, uh, the attitude of the Chinese elite was uh, China is the center of the world, um, and uh, uh, most other uh, countries that they knew about. Obviously, they didn't know about the, uh, really about the Europeans. They didn't have contact until the 16th century, except for sort of occasional. So um, their view was that uh, China is the center of the world. And uh, I was trying to explain uh, this attitude. Of course, I linked it to the, uh, the concept of ethnocentricity, which is, uh, I started the course with that most peoples regard themselves as um, uh, having a superior culture and so on. 
In the case of China, um, Chinese civilization was a huge success. Um, uh, the Chinese state was very old and uh, Chinese uh, culture was uh, highly developed. Um, and um, one, is, one um, scholar today refers to China as actually distinct from um, uh, other states in this world because it's a kind of uh, civilization state. It's a certain kind of civilization. Um, and with it, with with this very rich, uh, sort of at every level, its culture is extremely rich. Um, and the fact is that the neighboring state, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, they had all sort of uh, emerged as uh, variants on on Chinese culture. Um, and so, the sense of superiority was inherent in that uh, dependency, that cultural dependency. But also, China really uh, was uh, 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 overall very self-sufficient economically. It didn't, it didn't need um, uh, to trade extensively with other uh, places. Whereas, uh, in, in contrast, Europe uh, Europe didn't have, in the 16th century, didn't have enough gold and silver for its needs. Um, and also, uh, it wanted access to particularly luxury goods, and those were uh, elsewhere. And so, the Europeans were interacting more with the rest of the world, whereas China didn't need uh, manufacturers or uh, other uh, raw materials from the rest of the world. And so it was self-sufficient. And so they had this sense of superiority. And um, I noted that any state that like Japan or uh, Korea that wanted a relationship had to accept uh, the superiority of the, of the Chinese emperor. They had to sort of uh, pay trip. This is called the tributary system. Uh, they had to pay tribute. They had to acknowledge the uh, suzerainty of the Chinese emperor over themselves. And uh, this was symbolized by the sort of repeated bows or kowtowing, which ambassadors, uh, this was the etiquette of the court. Uh, you had to approach the emperor by repeatedly bowing or kowtowing to the emperor. Um, now, uh, I, I, I think I mentioned that this was uh, became problematic because as the, uh, their contact with the rest of the world, particularly the Europeans increased, and as European power uh, grew, the Chinese resisted. They thought their culture was best based on Confucianism, but also the deeply rooted uh, customs and traditions. Uh, and uh, they, for a long time, refused to modernize. It was only when they suffered repeated defeats on the part of the Europeans in the 19th and early 20th century that China embarked on uh, modernization. And in particular, it accepted the need, if it wanted to preserve China, uh, to uh, basically westernize the Tay. Uh, and this uh, uh, this uh, movement uh, of westernization of China in order to survive is um, very important in Chinese history. This is it's known as the May Fourth Movement. The May Fourth Movement, and it occurred after the World War I in 1919, between 1919 and 1921, a great cultural revolution uh, uh, developed in China of Western modern modernization. Now, are there any questions about what I've said?
Okay. So, yes. Professor. Yes. So you said that this hap the the modernization of China happened only in twentieth century. Twentieth century. That's that, okay. that they kept the quite system. late. Yes, it's really late. Uh, Japan uh, started uh, um, after the Americans showed up in the middle of the 19th century. Admiral Perry, this, uh, the Amer American admiral, appeared in Tokyo Harbor at the beginning of the 1850s with a fleet, terrified the Japanese, who also maintained a close society. And it was from that date that the Japanese began a rapid modernization. But in China, it was delayed 60 years. And of course, the Japanese uh, took advantage of that and they began to occupy China along with the European powers, but it was the Chinese who were the main sort of imperialist country against China. But that's of course, the, you, you'll have to sort of take modern history uh, in order to find out more, but it's all really important because uh, the emergence of China has been so dramatic and so on, so important. Um, so I would say that, um, um, so this is important in terms of uh, understanding ultimately the demise of the imperial China. Its ethnocentrism ultimately turned out to be a weakness um, but one has to realize, I want to make the point that all of that is in the past. And of course, the Chinese are nationalistic. The May 4th movement was a nationalist movement, but uh, they're, uh, they're strongly nationalist, but they're not the, the same as they were in, uh, in the past, in the, in the imperial period. No, they're completely open uh, to everything that's new in uh, society. In fact, it's really interesting because if you go there, and I have been there, uh, this mixture of the old and the new is really, really sort of quite uh, amazing. Uh, uh, so it's quite different. Now, to illustrate um, this uh, sort of control, um, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that of course, we know that Spain and Portugal embarked on their overseas voyages in the course of the 15th century. Of course, we began the course with that, the Portuguese and then the Spanish uh, uh, voyages of discovery and exploration. But what's amazing is that uh, great voyages marked China in the 15th century as well the Chinese began to send a series of great fleets out into the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And as many as 1,000 big Chinese ships known as junks were part of this fleet. And these fleets, uh, they visited most of the main trading ports in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific. And Therefore, some scholars argued in the past that, well, the Chinese, well, the, the, port, the, the Europeans became the sort of global explorers, discoverers. Um, the Europeans are the ones who went global, but it might have been China, China with these great fleets and so on. But I think that the subsequent scholarship has sort of, has sort of changed people's opinion because um, what we can say is that these great fleets that were sent out, I think there were seven great expeditions, uh, were essentially political enterprises. Yes, there was a great deal of trading that went on. But the fact of the matter is that China, through its merchants, had extensive relationships with all of the uh, societies of the Western Pacific and um, the Indian Ocean uh, really since the 13th and 14th centuries. Chinese merchants, here we're talking about the overseas Chinese, 
from South China, um, merchants, um, sort of, uh, they moved to places like the Philippines or Vietnam or Thailand. And there were Chinese colonies in many of these places. And the Chinese were, Chinese merchant class were doing all kinds of business um, with um, these uh, other societies. And this um, imperial enterprise that I'm, the great voyages of the 15th century, rather than being economic enterprises were attempts on the part of the Chinese imperial state uh, to, to basically get control of this, over this trade. The Chinese state was concerned over this sort of independent activity, commercial activity, which really then sort of illustrates what I said last time, the suspicion of the Chinese state towards the middle class, towards the merchants. Uh, this is uh, very important. The Chinese state was based on the landed class. It was bureaucratic and it was suspicious of the independent activities of the middle class. This is a, uh, a constant theme in imperial history and uh, this, um, these voyages illustrate that. Um, I Professor? should note that, yes, yes, so, uh, thank you. And uh, Andre, thank you for intruding. Yes. So it, in the book, uh, we read about this voyage that they, these voyages that they uh, overtook. And I was under the impression that it was exclusively into the Indian Ocean, but you also said they went no. into the Pacific? No, they did, yes. They were, and uh, where, where in the Pacific? Indonesia, in the Indonesia the Philippine Islands, uh, in those places. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, um, uh, I would say that uh, from a technological point of view, I would say that these Chinese sailing ships were comparable to the ship, the, the Spanish and Portuguese ships of the 15th, the early 16th century. Uh, but uh, uh, by the beginning of the 17th century, I would say that European uh, sailing vessels because the Europeans, this became basically now a fundamental feature of uh, the European economy. The technology of the Europeans uh, became superior to the Chinese by the beginning of the 17th century. Now, coming back to um, the um, internal history of China, um, uh, I outlined for you last time the way it worked with the emperor with absolute power, enjoying the mandate of heaven, uh, the Mandarin bureaucracy based on state examination, and the fact that uh, the, uh, the Mandarins themselves were largely recruited from, um, by, um, uh, from the landlord class. Um, the, and internally at the village level, the landlords and rich peasants completely dominated the villages. Um, and um, ordinarily the peasants accepted this situation. The overwhelming superiority of this whole landed uh, gentry class and the, uh, the, bure the, uh, uh, the bureaucratic setup was overwhelmingly strong and the peasants um, uh, more or less accepted it. But when times became bad, for example, when there was prolonged famine, when the debts of the peasants or the heavy taxation of the state or the state demanded forced labor, the state used uh, forced labor in order to build roads and canals and they would require the peasants to leave their land and work on these projects. When all of this became too much, uh, the peasants uh, had the capacity and they did rebel. And in fact, we have, 
we know that there were many small and large scale peasant rebellions in Chinese history, um, right up to the 14th century. In other words, China was like Europe, because as I explained, Europe, um, Europe um, class conflict was a fundamental feature. And so it was in, um, in China. Now, you may think that class conflict is a bad thing, but as a matter of fact, uh, class conflict uh, historically has given societies a certain dynamism. The lower classes rebel, the upper classes respond. Uh, there's a constant sort of um, uh, uh, sort of ongoing uh, battle contest, and it does lead both both the upper and lower classes to innovate. Professor, uh, yes, you said they rebelled up until what century? The 14th century. 14th. Okay, got it. Yes. Um, contrast that with the state of India or the state of the Ottoman Empire, where you have the caste system in India, you have the millet system, this kind of permanent religions divisions in the uh, Ottoman Empire. You have this all-powerful emperor and bureaucracy in in India and the Ottoman Empire, and um, it basically uh, does not permit uh, this kind of development of classes and class conflict, which in Europe and China led to a certain dynamism. Now in Europe, it was uh, class conflict was decisive, especially the breakthrough of the middle class at the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the uh, early modern period. In China, it never got quite to that point until the 20th century. But in Europe, uh, uh, there is, uh, in the end, uh, an intimate relationship between the development of capitalism and revolutionary class conflict in Western society. Uh, more of that later. But at least in China, we can say that there was this, um, this uh, ferment in Chinese society. And now that brings me to, brings me just a second. That brings me to the uh, Ming Dynasty. That's where we uh, uh, we begin the sort of uh, more uh, uh, detailed account of uh, the development of the Chinese state in the um, late Middle Age and early modern period. Uh, we're going to follow this down into the 19th century. In any case. The Ming Dynasty arose at the end of the 14th century. Um, and it arose as a, precisely because of one of these big peasant based uh, uprisings, uh, an uprising of the lower classes in Chinese society in the late 14th century. And um, the dynasty was as a matter of fact, founded by a Chinese peasant whose name was Zhu Wanzhang. Zhu Wanzhang, the founder of um, the uh, Ming Dynasty. Uh, he was born in South China in 1328. Now, at that time, um, the uh, China was under the control of um, the so-called Wan Dynasty. Uh, you see the dates, 1279, 1368. Uh, Zhu Wanjiang is born in 1328. And he leads the peasant struggle 
which leads to the overthrow of the Yuan dynasty uh, in 1368. Uh, Zhu Wanzhang becomes the first emperor of the Ming dynasty. Um, so uh, what was this all about? Well, what happened was uh, the Yuan dynasty was, uh, they were foreign invaders. They were Mongols. Um, they invaded and conquered China at the end of the 13th century in 1279. And this is part of uh, recall when we dealt with the Ottoman Empire, when we dealt with uh, uh, the history of India. It's sort of the Mongol expansion across Central Asia, driven by the buildup of population and livestock herds um, and attracted by the weakness of the river valley civilizations in the Near East and in India and also China, you have Mongol and Tur Turkish expansion from about the, the 12th century onwards. And uh, this Mongol conquest of China was part of that movement. And so um, uh, I believe it was Genghis Khan, the Mongol ruler who uh, conquered China in 1279 and established this Wan, Wan dynasty. Um, now, um, the, um, so we have Zhu Wanzhang leading a, uh, a peasant-based rebellion um, in starting in, 1352, he organized a band of peasants in southern China and challenged the rule of the Wan dynasty, of these Mongols. And in 1356, his band that expanded to hundreds of thousands of peasant rebels, and they succeeded in taking the southern capital of China, the city of Nanjing. The city of Nanjing was seized by uh, uh, by uh, Zhu Wanzhang and this peasant rebellion um, in 1352. And on this basis, then um, the, uh, the 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 new uh, uh, the rival to the Mongols. Uh, basically expelled the Mongols in 1368, establishing himself as emperor and founder of the Ming dynasty. Um, uh, one of the things that he did was um, he uh, moved the capital of this new state, new, sta uh, new Ming dynasty to Beijing from Nanjing. Nanjing is in the south. It's the dominant city in the south. Even today, I would say it was the most important city in southern China. And uh, Beijing is the most important city in the north. So it, it was moved, uh, uh, this, the capital was moved north. And the reason for that was that there was still fear that the Mongols might reinvade the country from the north. So in order to uh, prevent that, uh, the emperor moved from Nanjing to Beijing. Now, uh, he, uh, uh, Zhu Wanzhang came to power as a great reformer, as a great reformer, or I should say restorer, because the Mongols were guarded by the majority of the Chinese population, which were Han, they were ethnically Han as intruders, conquerors. They wanted to get rid of them. And so uh, the coming to power of Zhu Wanzhang meant that the Han people had been restored to power uh, by the new Ming dynasty. And the themes of um, uh, Zhu Wanzhang's reform, which laid the foundations 
of the of the of the Ming state for over three centuries uh, were first of all the uh, restoration of Chinese unity, the unity of the Chinese state. Secondly, agrarian reconstruction. The peasants were in a bad way. That had been the initial cause of the re revolt. So restoring the peasantry. And thirdly, a kind of cultural restoration based on Confucianism. So let me repeat. The reunification of the Chinese state, peasant or agrarian reconstruction, and Confucian regeneration. These are the three themes. Professor, uh, what do you yeah. mean by pe like uh, uh, the, the second point, agrarian reconstruction? I'm getting to that right now. Okay, got it. I mean land reform. I mean the fact is that the landlords had, uh, and the uh, sort of the, the Mongol state had become extremely repressive. They were extracting uh, huge amounts of tribute and rent from the peasants. The amount of land that the peasants had available to them was extremely limited. And so fundamental to this restoration was land reform. And by land reform, I mean a redistribution of the land out of the hands of the landlords and into the hands of the peasants. He took away a lot of the land from the landlords over their protests and gave it back to the peasants. He was a peasant himself. And so in the course of his reign, more than 50% of the land was basically put into the hands of the peasants. Of course, the landlords continued. Uh, he should have gotten rid of the landlords completely, as Mao did in, after 1949, but he left them and they came back, as you'll see. Uh, uh, it became, the problem re reoccurred, as you'll see. But uh, uh, he took away a, a good part of the land, he gave it back to the peasants. That's very rare in history. It's extremely rare. Um, and um, um, it's a, uh, in addition to that, um, he ordered a massive decentralization of the Chinese state. The bureaucracy had become swollen. Uh, it was predatory, parasitical on the population, too many taxes on them. And so he ordered a decentralization uh, down to the, to the local level. Uh, and so there was a massive reduction of the bureaucracy under this uh, great ruler. Um, and added to the which the army had grown, of course, given the battle against the Mongols and given the sort of uh, war that had beset China, the army was very large, over 2 million men. These Chinese armies were enormous. And this was, uh, uh, this army was 2 million. Well, no other state has ever had an army of 2 million men. Well, he didn't disband the army, no. But he informed the army that they would have to grow their own food. Uh, that they couldn't live off the food that they grabbed from the peasants. They couldn't exploit the peasants. So all of these were important steps. And in addition to that, um, he introduced severe penalties. Uh, remember, this is, a, uh, this is a great reform. And uh, there was in the Chinese state constant uh, problems with corruption and factionalism. He introduced severe laws to punish these things. And beyond that, he built up the road system. He restored the canals. In China, the canals are very important. There are two great rivers in China. Let me see if I can
Yes, this is the, uh, the Chinese state. Uh, the most important river, you can see it here, is a kind of blue ribbon running through uh, the center of China. This is the Yangtze River. And then in the north, there's another river known as the Yellow River. Well, the emperors in the course of the Middle Ages had built canals uh, between these two rivers and connecting them were a whole series of canals to facilitate transport by barge. And so you have the Yangtze River, you have the Yellow River, and you have this canal system in addition to the roads. And all of this was restored uh, in the new Ming Dynasty. Uh, in addition to that, um, on the roads, uh, there was a messenger system set up so that important messages between the different provinces, between the provinces and the capital, a uh, whole a rapid messenger system based on signals and the use of horses was set up uh, to tie the whole of China together more closely. Um, and the last point I make is that Confucian orthodoxy was now, uh, this became the ideology of the regime. Um, that is to say, for China to be fully restored, it had to undergo kind of ethical uh, restoration. And that, of course, by this point, Confucianism was the uh, was the uh, what the way of looking at the world, the philosophy, the morality of the upper class, and so a strict uh, Confucian orthodoxy was imposed. Uh, now, this uh, point, I would make the point that this is a, a sort of typical of uh, these kinds of societies. We're talking about typical agrarian landlord societies, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Hindus and the uh, and the uh, Muslims in India and uh, even Europe, because you see that even in Europe, um, in Europe in the 16th century, when um, when uh, the Reformation comes. The way the emperor and the popes try to sort of restore the situation, their whole idea is to go back to the Middle Ages. And so uh, restoring the Roman Catholic faith is the idea. Well, that's comparable to sort of the restoration of Confucianism. And you see similar things when the Ottoman Empire gets into trouble in the 17th century, uh, the restoration uh, that is uh, introduced by Mehmed IV uh, is in terms of, oh, we're going to restore Islam. So um, this idea of restoration is typical. Professor. Of, yes. Sorry, you cut out when you were talking about the restoration that Mehmed IV was putting out? Yes. And, you... uh, I'm talking about the Ottoman Empire in the 17th century when uh, corruption and so on, and they were losing to the Europeans. They responded at the beginning by simply saying, well, we need to just go back to what Solomon the Magnificent was all about. We need to restore Ottoman supremacy by basically basing ourselves on Islam and jihad. You understand? So they, they um, quote unquote, went back to basics with... Uh... Yes, go back to basics. I even made the comparison with... Uh, what we're dealing with, what we were dealing with until it all has collapsed. But uh, when capitalism got into trouble in the 1970s, what did the elites do here? They imposed neoliberalism, neoliberalism. Let's go back to liberalism, uh, the free market. If we just free everything up, uh, everything will be the same, will be wonderful. Well, we've seen the result. I'm saying that it's a, uh, it's a very common tendency in society in general. Uh, if, if things go bad, the way to 
restore things is just to go back to the good old ways. It's the good old ways. That's basically it. And that's it? exactly what Zhu Yang Zhang did by returning yes, yes. Confucianism. And, and that was the pro that was a big problem. That was a big problem. Uh, so he like problem is in he held back China from progressing. That's or... right. He did in the end. He restored China uh, on giving uh, this uh, uh, really important uh, restoration. You, you'll see that they did make a substantial amount of progress in the uh, late 15th and 16th century. China did see a lot of economic growth, but uh, this conservative restoration, and which was accompanied by suspicion of the middle class who were the innovators in Chinese society, I wanna stress that, just as they were in European society, they were suppressed by uh, the, uh, the state, uh, the bureaucracy, the landlord class in China, the emperors, but Confucianism plays, this is, ideology plays a big role in this suppression. Uh, Confucianism is against the merchants. As a matter of fact, as I said last time, um, the Confucian notion is that the landlords are at the top of society, the peasants are second, the craftsmen are third, and the merchants are at the bottom. The merchants, uh, the Confucianism is ethical. The merchant, the view of uh, the Confucianists is that the merchants are tricky exploiters and have to be kept in their place. This is an attitude, of course, uh, which is uh, uh, sort of typical of landlords. Uh, this is uh, the way the European feudal classes looked at uh, uh, the middle class as well. But in China, the state was so strong that they could actually get away with keeping uh, the middle class in uh, control, which so, brings, yes, go ahead. Let's so have- professor when you, when yeah. you said um, a conservative restoration, do you mean the fact, so uh, also when you referred to him not abolishing landlords completely and that being a mistake, do you mean it in the fact that when he returned, when Confucianism returned, they got their strengths back? They did over time, as you'll see, um, gradually over the centuries that followed the first Ming emperor, the landlords crept back. Uh, they were living in the villages. They extended loans to the peasants. The peasants got in debt. They lost their land. The landlords would use their coercive powers to seize some land. And over time, more and more of the land passed back into their hand. Until the 17th century, the land reform of the late 14th century, three centuries, was essentially annulled, canceled. The landlords would once again become overwhelmingly dominant. Uh, but I, I, I'll get to that story, but that's what happened. They came back. That's why I said it was, uh, you know, that the, they, uh, they, they, they were persistent and they were still ensconced and uh, they restored themselves. So here's what basically uh, what happened in China during the Ming period from the late 14th to the middle of the 17th century. That's the period of the Ming dynasty. What happened was based on these reforms, you have um, a substantial increase in the population and indeed expansion of the economy. The economy does expand from the late 14th until the beginning of the 17th century, but the population grows even faster. So the economy is expanding, but for uh, there to be uh, what really counts is growth per capita 
growth. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, it's not uh, overall increase in, in economic output. It's the degree to which there is an actual increase in what we call GDP per capita. Is there a, not, a sufficient growth, not simply extensive growth, but growth in productivity, uh, growth per capita, uh, to keep up with the increase in population. Well, that didn't happen because the middle class and their innovation, their innovations were suppressed. Um, and as a result, the Chinese population, let me find the figures, um, I'll read them. In, 1393, at the beginning of the uh, Ming Dynasty, there were 85 million people in China. By 1650, there were 268 million people in China, which I, I believe is an increase. It's uh, the population has increased three times, maybe a little bit more than three times. Well. Um, the ideological control of Confucianism, the attacks on the middle class, and the gradual return of the power of the landlords uh, basically uh, created uh, an economic crisis by the middle of the 17th century. This is the underlying reason uh, for the uh, <clears throat> ultimate failure of the Ming dynasty, which will come to. Uh, so, Professor. Yes. So, uh, basically. Listen, I, I, Andrew, I want to say something. You know, um, your interventions, like, listen, in uh, real, like, uh, you're, we're, we're in a first year class there. And, of course, it's uh, mainly a uh, lecture. But le let me tell you something, students. The way things evolve as you go through the history uh, curriculum is it's more and more discussion. It's uh, a dialogue between the professor and the students, just as Andrea and I are having this discussion. That's what goes on. And uh, ultimately you cannot, you, you have to break out of the passivity and you have to begin to sort of really think about the material learning and engage in a dialogue with your professor. That's really, the uh, in terms of really learning stuff, that's what has to happen. Yes, Andre. So um, over the course of the Ming Dynasty, the China as a whole got more uh, economically powerful, but the individual peasants didn't? That's Is right. that what you meant by the GDP per capita? Yes, uh, that, I meant that. And also the fact that as time wore on, the landlords got more and more of the, uh, of the wealth. And it, uh, uh, the sort of per capita thing can obscure the rising social inequality. And I can illustrate that uh, when you look at sort of American society, let's, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can see that I'm, uh, of course I'm interested in, I love the past, but the present also concerns me. And what we see in Canadian and, and American society is a vast increase in wealth. American, the United States is still overwhelmingly the, the richest country in the world. Uh, China is is uh, on its um, uh, on its back, but um, the, uh, the United States is still well ahead. But um, and so I think uh, um, the um, but the, the 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 thing about the United States and indeed Canada is that the levels of social inequality have reached alarming levels. The ordinary people have less and less of the wealth of, of the society. It's more and more concentrated at the top. And that's a, a recipe for um, uh, social unrest. As we see, we saw in, in, um, in Canada in the last months, the outbreak of the truckers revolt. Many, many of these people are sort of, uh, sort of petty bourgeois or workers aspiring to become petty bourgeois. They want to be little entrepreneurs and they feel squashed by 
the state and by the the money of the of the rich. That's why you see this alliance between the NDP and the liberals. The elites are scared. So they've come in with this whole program now. Did you notice in the last few days? I'm not knocking it. Listen, we could we need to get what we what we can take. Dental care, child care, uh, farmer care, a social house or sort of affordable housing. Uh, we need all these things. We're desperate for them. So it's a good thing. But uh, you see the connection between this and the social inequality in the society. It's led to a kind of crisis point. And that's what's going on. And so um, uh, take this. So what I'm saying is that in the Ming period, they did nothing. And uh, they were overthrown. Well, we'll continue in the next class.